PDUs at a pizza joint that we go to. We're not sure if that's going to be in person or online or maybe a combination of both. <laughs> so I'm going to have to see. But it will, whatever we're going to do is always going to be on the third Thursday of the month. So you can put that into your calendar. And um, any other events that we mentioned that are happening in and there's a lot of virtual events that are happening in other chapters so that you can earn your PDUs. Um, we're going to post those also onto our social media. We have a Facebook site, we have a Twitter, um, we have a um, well, other social media, any website um, events that we think are significant, we'll put it on the website and also in our newsletter. We also have an upcoming training event, a PMP exam prep class, because the PMP exam is changing in January. So there is a class that I'm actually teaching um, for two weeks. Um, it's a live virtual instructor-led class, just like kind of like what we're doing here. And uh, 35 training hours, it's in the evenings, Monday through Friday. And um, if you're interested, um, you can be able to find that information on the etpmi.org website. Okay, so any other announcements that we need to provide? Oh, one more announcement. Yep. We are Professional Development Day. This is a big deal for us because this is an opportunity where you can earn a lot of PDUs in one session, as well as we have a stellar setup for being able to provide a keynote as well as a lot of breakout sessions. Um, we provide a breakfast as well as lunch and um, seminars all day. It is scheduled to hopefully um, be in person at Bridgewater Place um, on September 18th. And depending on how things go, we might do a combination of I don't know. We're still trying to figure out this whole, this whole thing. <laughs> we're we're in crazy times right now, so we're kind of have to be flexible and fluid with things. But this is kind of where we're at right now. We do need um, breakout. We need speakers and sponsors. So Bob, if you want to um, have anything else to add to this, Bob is professional development. I mean, uh, uh, and he's also leading the charge of PDD. Thanks, Dale. Yeah, uh, if anybody's interested in uh, being one of our breakout speakers, we're looking for some of those, as well as uh, Alan also mentioned, we're continuing to look for sponsors. So please feel free to contact uh, me or any of the board members if you are interested in any of those things. Thanks, Dale. Okay, excellent. All right, so any other announcements that we have before we get going here with Aaron? Dale, just to kind of piggyback on what Bob said, if anyone or your organization is interested in sponsoring PDD, uh, <clears throat> the information about the various levels of sponsorship that are available uh, can be seen on the ETPMI website under sponsors. and. Uh, at that link, you'll get information that would connect you to me if you want to discuss those or if you want to uh, ask about other possible options, uh, by all means, get in touch and we'll, we'll investigate it. So thank you. All right. Yeah, well, thank you for one, that, Alan. One last thing, Dale. Uh, the, the early bird rates for registration are now available, so you can save yourself some money on registering for that early. So uh, thank you, Siri, for that note. Thanks, Dale. Yes. Thank you, Siri. Yes, it's good through the end of June. So do you have the, what's the early bird rate for this? I don't, you know, what that early bird rate is? Yeah, it's 150 for members and 175 for non-members. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right. So um, for our, our session here, we're going to have Aaron do our Simply Strategy Simple strategy to spark stellar project teams. And Erin has asked that um, you show your face so that she can make sure that she's, you know, she's not shocking you with anything she's 
providing you. So you could keep your video on, you can be able to interact, you could type in the chat box, you could raise your hand, whatever, throw things at her, you know, whatever, <laughs> just whatever works for you. Okay, because we want to make this as interactive as possible. Because Erin is awesome. Um, I go to Erin and I go to the same church, but she's she's such a, she's such an amazing person to me. I tapped her on the shoulder because I'm like, Erin, we need we need your presence. We need your, your you're just gonna just gonna love her like I do. So Erin has over 20 years of leadership experience expediting results at corporations such as Target, Whirlpool and team health by investing in people for individual and team performance. She's led teams of project managers, process analysts, learning and development analysts, and quality analysts through countless business and organizational changes. More than anything, she enjoys the camaraderie of getting breakthrough results with others and seeks to cultivate that wherever she is. She's also the creator of expertonboarding.com and founder of Profitable Training. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Erin. Thank you so much, Dale. So and thank you all for having me. I couldn't tell you how excited I am to be here, even if I tried. Because as a learning and development specialist, it's just kind of, we're, we're kind of like your, your cousins in a way, don't you think? At least I think so. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen here. Let me make sure I've got that before I jump right in. Okay, does everybody see uh, the tall order that I promised that I was going to give you a simple strategy to spark stellar project teams? Oh, I hope I can live up to that one. So um, I'm really excited to talk about this because as Dale said, I really enjoy camaraderie in teams, especially when teams are performing at exceptional levels. That's what makes it fun, isn't it? So feel free to just chat along with me, but before we really get rocking and rolling, I'm going to share with you a poll. And so I want to know why you're here tonight. So you should see a poll on screen now. Why did you come to tonight's session? And you can check as many as apply to you. And if you don't see the poll, that's okay. You can also share with us in the chat. Feel free to just put it in the chat box as well. Okay, and I jumped ahead. I didn't mean to open that second question, but go ahead and answer the second question. And while you're doing that, um, well, I'll wait until you finish answering the question and I'll end the polling. And then you'll see why I'm asking what kind of project manager you want to be. I'll give you like 10 more seconds. <laughs> Some of the chats always get really funny and they get me. I think everybody's gotten in there. So let me go ahead and end the polling and Let's see what you, what you said. So most of you wanna grow and develop. Um, we only had one person that had nothing better to do. So that's a good sign. We had a lot of people sign up and I'm expecting a lot will watch the recording. And then in terms of the what kind of project manager you wanna be, I'm excited to hear you say rock star. So let me go back to my screen here and share with you what I'm thinking. I'm thinking project managers are one of these three things. You're either a magician behind the scenes making magic happen, or people look at you and they hear wah, wah, wah when you come in, or you're, you know, you're like a Garth Brooks kind. Everybody wants to be around you. And that's what I'm hoping we'll do today, that we'll work through how you can interact with people individually and as teams to help your teams become high performing and stellar while you become a rock star. So a little bit about me, I'm a reluctant project manager. What do I mean by that? As a learning and development professional, what I've done throughout my career is created programs, develop programs, training programs, programs for performance improvement. And if you do something like that, let me tell you, it's just like a project. It's got a life of its own and you have to work with a lot of different people. You have stakeholders invested and involved and then you have all sorts of other people that you're working to get deliverables back from. 
So now what am I doing? Well, I'm a small business owner and I work on helping other small business owners keep great employees. So I'm a solopreneur and I'm working to kind of break the mold. And I'll tell you about that later today. But my leadership history, as Dale said, is in training and project management, process documentation, continuous improvement. Um, and I also work with nonprofits along the way. And a lot of what I've learned and distilled down into my repertoire is just the same everywhere I go. So whatever I talk about today, I want you to know I have experienced it. I have experienced it firsthand and it resonates with me. So I know these things work. So first of all, when you think about getting a team, you all inherit a team, generally speaking. Raise your hand or tell us in chat if you have been able to hand select any of the teams you've worked with. I don't see any movement. So that means we all inherit a team. So what do you do with that? Never, I like that, no. And don't you wish? I mean, wouldn't that be a great present? So when you receive a team, do you think, oh, what a great opportunity? Or do you say, oh, geez, what if, you know, do I have the bad news bears this time? You know, how am I going to get through this? But really, each and every assembly of individuals is an opportunity. And you might be thrown like a, a pile of lemons and you might need to make some uh, lemonade. But you as the leader are somewhere here in the middle. And if you think about um, where you are in the middle, you you can kind of lead forward instead of being the dictator. Um, you can be the one pulling forward. Let me check in real quick. Can everybody see my screen? You can see my screen. Okay. I just want to make sure. All right. So let's take a, another look at where we're headed. So if you are starting with a firefighting situation, like who feels like this is your job today? You're just fighting fires all over the place while you're trying to make progress to the next milestone. And you're trying to work to the next phase of that Gantt chart to get to the, to the end of the rainbow, so to speak. How do you get from firefighting on your projects to everybody working together and looking like those happy people? I mean, that's what we're going to look at today. And the first thing we're going to do to do that is look at Tuckman's uh, theory of team development by phases. So show of hands, who's heard of forming, storming, norming, performing? Okay, I see a couple of hands and you can say it in chat. Say yes, been there, done that, know what it's about. Okay, so we've got some. So forming, let's talk really quickly through this. When we think about forming a, a team in that model, that's when people are coming together and they're doing two things. They're sizing each other up and they're also trying to figure out what the team's purpose is and then what individual roles are all about. So the sizing each other up, I think that's always funny. You're trying to figure out, okay, who's this person? What's he or she all about? And if you talk to somebody like Lou Holtz, they might say that people are all um, always asking three questions when they look at somebody else and they're sizing up. They're wondering, um, what does this person think about, you know, are they committed to excellence? And then he would always uh, say that they would all also ask, can I, trust him or her. So can I trust this person? Are they committed to excellence? And do they care about me? And do they care about the company or the organization? So those are the three things people are generally asking. But like I said, the other thing people are doing is they're trying to figure out, okay, what, what are we doing? What's our purpose as a team? And then what's my role in that team? So that's the forming part. So what people need is clarification. And then as the team forms, then we start storming. And storming is always lots of fun, right? That's where everybody's trying to figure out uh, what the boundaries are. And they're still looking for that clarity, but now they're expressing their opinions and they're trying to figure out their roles by working on them. And working styles are tested, uh, especially as circumstances grow unfavorable, kind of like in a situation that we're living in today called COVID-19. I'm sure there's been a lot of storming, especially for new teams, kind of getting through March and April. So they're working through this conflict and that's a really necessary thing. Teams need to work through conflict. It's just natural and it's inevitable because people have opinions and perspectives. So as they go through this, uh, we're gonna see some settling hopefully as we move into the norm phase. 
when we get into the norming, we're still going to see some challenges and some dissension and disagreements, but it should be leveling out to a degree. This is when the team is a little stronger and now people are um, keeping safe and, pro and professional parameters and the common goal now is for everybody to come together and beat the competition. And that's what we want. We want everybody working towards a unified goal. So a spirit of acceptance starts to take over, but you're going to see a little conflict. And then we move into performing. And that's after we do some norming for a while, then we get to see how people are um, thriving and the team is growing together and growing even stronger. And you're seeing this line come through. And I call this the line of peace and harmony. So it's my peace barometer. So I can say, what is the level of peace and harmony on the team? It's pretty stable and forming because everybody's polite to each other. When you're first starting, you're going to be really polite and courteous. And then when you get into storming, everybody's kind of starting to box each other a little bit. And so the peace goes up and down. And then the harmony starts to kind of stabilize and ebb and flow. And then as we go through performing, it really starts to accelerate and go up. The one phase that I'm not putting on the slide today is adjourning. And that's where you're celebrating. And then the team members are disbanding. But that's because it's not really in scope for our discussion today. So that is Tuckman's phases of team development. Now, um, that's the backdrop for today, but the real meat of our discussion comes into research that came out of the Human Dynamics Laboratory of MIT. So this is about 2012. That team, led by a researcher named Alex Pentland, uh, used sociometric badges to, to analyze the communication of high-performing teams. So what they did is they looked at a wide variety of teams across industries and across all sorts of different makeups and all sorts of reasons to be assembled. But what they wanted to find out is they compared like for like teams, so teams that looked similar, but performed at varying rates. So one team would be low performing, one would be middle performing, another would be high performing. So they got a wide array of performance. And what they did was they, put these sociometric badges around everybody's neck and they monitored everything that these individuals said and more importantly, how they said it. So here's a kicker. They would put this uh, badge around their neck and they would capture things like the tone of voice, the inflection, the frequency of discussion, the brevity or the length of something that somebody is saying, they, they even captured body language because they would find out who was standing next to people. Like if I was talking side by side, it would capture that. Or if I was talking face to face, it would capture that as well. The only thing they didn't measure in all of this was words. They captured everything else. So what they derived out of all of, all of this was that they could tell you by this data, the sociometric data, how well a team was performing compared to others. They didn't even have to look at performance data. So they used the performance data just to figure out which teams were high performing. But once they figured out what the common uh, elements are and the hallmarks of great teams are, they said, now we know how we can find it. And it's, it's, it's pretty wild to see this consistent pattern among high performing teams. So let's talk about what those hallmarks are. In those high-performing teams, the team members talk relatively equally. So if you go to a team meeting, you're pretty much going to hear from everybody. And what's really interesting is that you're going to hear little brief snippets from everybody. They're going to talk with kind of their market share of the meeting time. They're also going to face each other, and they're going to have lots of energies in their gestures and their conversations. So I, I make lots of gestures and this doesn't mean that you have to be Italian or anything like that, but you know, energy is relative to an individual. So whatever high energy is for a particular individual is what they were capturing. These individuals would connect with each other and not through the team leader. So they didn't have to bounce off the facilitator each and every time. And then they would also have side conversations and back channel conversations. And this would happen in the meetings. About half of the time that these teams were talking, they were talking to the group in the meeting. And the other half of the time, they were talking to other people on the team individually. 
And then they would go and explore information from other places and bring it back to the team. That was another thing they noticed. So those are the key hallmarks. Now, let me ask you if, you, if you look at this, tell me in chat which team you think is the high performing team, the one on the left or the one on the right? Yeah, so, so far we've got one person who's, who's ventured, okay, we've got more, <laughs> right? It takes a minute to get to the chat. So yeah, you can see a lot more bedazzlement going on on the right. So that's kind of a giveaway. Um, but there are some other subtle things in it. So you guys are picking up on what a high performing team looks like and you don't even know what all these little, little arrows and everything represents. So the three things that they noticed as trends is that they saw energy, engagement, and exploration. And we'll talk about each one, but the energy and the engagement were within the team and the exploration was external to the team. So the energy is about the number of exchanges between team members. And so that's what you're seeing on this slide. You're seeing, okay, we have some movement from individual to individual. And on the other one, we have a lot of exchanges. And not only did they say that it's about how many exchanges between team members, they started quantifying into low value and high value. Now, I think we're all probably on board with the idea that text and email are low value. High value would be face-to-face -face and then even uh, phone and video to a point. And why do I say to a point? Well, if you get this many people on screen, is that really high value? Now, today is a bad example because we're not trying to uh, accomplish a project. We're just trying to talk to each other and learn. Totally different idea. But if you're working with people and you're trying to get some big results and you're trying to get something really audacious done, then you need to have communication in smaller pockets and smaller teams. So they were looking for high value contacts and exchanges a lot more than lower value. So it might take several low value contacts to reach one high value contact. So face to face in today's world, we all know that being in person is the gold standard, but we're kind of stuck with this Zoom situation in a lot of cases right now. And that face to face is at least better than just being on the phone and hearing audio only. Something else I wanna say about face to face, why do you think it is that being in person is better than being on video? Tell me in chat what you think about that. I'm just curious, because I have my own ideas. Why is it better to be in person than on video conferencing software? Whole body language, that's an interesting thought. So I have two theories. And as you continue to share yours, I'll share with you my two. The first one is about shared experiences. We have fewer shared experiences when we're face to face on video. For example, I'm sitting in a different chair than Kimberly's sitting in. Dale is sitting in a different room. Uh, Dale might have really, you know, warm feet right now, and maybe mine are really freezing, and I'm just, you know, so what we're experiencing is different. My desk is different, but if we're in a room together around a conference table, we're all experiencing the same environment, the same temperature, the same conference table, the same access to things around us, and there's something about shared experiences and shared surroundings that I think kind of unifies people. The other thing is, let me see, I see cross chat, nonverbal clues. Okay, so you can see more of that when you're in person. So these are some good ideas. Another thing is I can't reach through the screen and hit you. So it's not as real. And then I, I also can't reach through the screen and hug you. So that level of, oh no, or oh yes, all of that is diminished greatly because it just can't happen. So there's a level of exhilaration that we might experience um, because now something different could really happen. You could just like come up and just hit me in the face if you wanted to, if we were in person, not that you would, but you can't do that on screen. So it kind of diminishes it anyway. So this, the first thing they found was energy and that was number of contacts. Second one was engagement. What does the engagement look like across the whole team? And that's about the distribution of all of the energy among all the team members. So on the left, you see, you have a couple of super connectors. So those are the glowing yellow people. 
And they're the ones that are reaching out a lot and talking to a lot of different people. And so we've all probably had teams like that where you have a couple of people who do a lot of the connecting. And then you've got some people that just kind of do their own thing and they don't reach out to anybody except maybe the project manager and probably not even them. Um, so that's not considered healthy nor thriving. On the other side, you see everybody is equally in the game with having these contacts. And so it's all about that distribution across everyone. So let me ask you, who are you? When you think about a team that you're on right now or a team that you're leading right now, are you the kind of uh, leader or facilitator where everybody is coming to you instead of going to each other? Or do you see them going to each other? But if you're sitting in the center, kind of like in a wheel where you're in the hub of all the spokes, then that's probably not going to be a high performing team because they're always coming back to center. So something to consider. Now the third area is exploration. And this is where they go and have communications outside the team. Well, what are they looking for in those other teams to bring back to their team? These individuals are typically looking for different perspectives. So they're going out and they're kind of testing theories or maybe they're uh, benchmarking or they're getting other information, other ideas, and then they bring that back. And that's extremely valuable. If you think about the diversity that it brings back to the team, it's incredible. Um, and, the, and the learning that's augmented that they can bring back, that's also really helpful. Um, but that was a key hallmark. That was the third area. These people are on the hunt for fresh perspectives and then they bring them back. So those are the three areas that they said were the, the things that they noticed uh, for high performing, for the communications of high performing teams. So I want you to take a minute for just one minute to reflect on everything you just saw and plot out what you think is happening in your world today on one of the teams that you're leading. And if you're only leading one because you're in very large projects, maybe that one. So think about it. And as you're thinking about it, let me ask you a few questions. Who on your project team only communicates to you? Who on your team doesn't communicate at all? And who on your team communicates a lot? And to how many people do they communicate? So my challenge to you, maybe not in this very moment, but soon before, I would say in the next 24 hours before you forget all of these things, is you might plot out your own little diagram here of everybody in your team and figure out where all the arrows are going and really start looking at it and think about, is this a high performing team? And if not, how can I work on that? Because that's what we're talking about next. So what can you do about this? Here's my question for you. Who are those connections between? Tell me what you think in chat. When you think about these interactions, who are those interactions between? Are they between teams or, I like that, equals. That's a great one, 3JJ. Everyone individually. So, and you're hitting right on it. Um, individually. What is a team made up of? Equals and individuals. So what should your strategy revolve around? The best way to build a great team is not to select individuals for their smarts or accomplishments, but to learn how they communicate and to shape and guide the team so that it follows successful communication patterns. So a lot of times we talk about team building, but we forget that teams are made up of individuals. And I know as project managers, you're not able to go out and do team building exercises anyway. And to be quite honest with you, I'm glad because I think a lot of that stuff is just, well, don't even get me started because on the L&D side, I just think what a colossal waste of money. There are better ways to do things at work to build teams on the job than to take them into some kind of experiential activity, in my opinion. So individuals is where you want to shift your focus. So you wanna think about those individuals who are communicating a lot or the ones who aren't communicating at all. 
So now that we've said that, I'm wondering what you guys are, are thinking about all of this. I'm wondering if you're like, okay, this is, this is really wild or I've, I've got some new insights. Um, so let me ask you really quickly. I want to give you a choice. I was thinking about sending you into breakout rooms for, you know, three minutes just to talk about uh, what you just digested and to talk it out with some others, especially what you're thinking about the team that you're leading right now. But tell me in chat if you're in, if you're out or do a race, do me a, a thumbs up or a thumbs down. If you like the idea, don't like the idea of breakout room. Learner choice is key and nobody wants to be brave and vote first i got one for breakout one for no 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 okay that's what i wanted to know good deal so now we will proceed sorry dale you got you got voted out i don't this is a very vocal team i like that um high performing team you guys are communicating i'm trying to build these interactions among you and some of you are biting i love it yes you are Notoriously, I don't think it's all that bad. Um, but I, I, some of my best days and some of my most fun memories are with some project managers. I was trying to, by the way, I was recruited a couple of times to be a project manager and I was just could not, when I see what you guys do on a daily basis, I just, there's no way, there's no way. I have incredible admiration and respect for each of you. So we're going to go back to the previous model, which is Tuckman's model of team development over time, because now we're going to use it as our backdrop for what we need to do with individuals to drive those communication connections. So the first phase is forming. So when the team is forming, you need to know what success looks like and why it matters. Because remember, we said people are looking for role clarity and they're looking for team purpose. They're trying to figure out what's the point of the team and what's my point here as well. So in this phase, if you want to foster communication between people, because that's what you're trying to do, you know a high performing work team means lots of energy, lots of contacts between individuals. You also know that means lots of an equal distribution in that energy. And then we're not going to get into the third one just yet, but you know that you're trying to drive that. So, um, I, oh, I love that. Uh, yeah, they need lots of team roles and responsibilities during forming. So here are a few things that you can do in the forming phase. So first, make sure everybody's got that North Star in their head and in, in, their, um, in their sights. They need to be super clear on the goal and the purpose uh, of the team. And I'm sure you guys know this. I mean, I'm sure I'm not telling you anything new, but sometimes we take it for granted that if we say it once or twice, but I would challenge you, get the team to tell you what the goal is. Get the team to tell you what the purpose is. Get them to tell each other in different ways during that initial phase, because it means more when we tell others instead of when we are told. So be thinking about that. Also, I cannot tell you how valuable a project walk is. Um, and I think of a process walk. So the, one of the first things I'll do with any team that I'm working with is if I'm trying to learn what they're doing and I also want to build that team and build that community, I'll get them to walk the process with me. So they'll walk through uh, the main process of their business or the process at hand that we're working through. For, for this group, we're talking about the project. Whatever that project is or whatever that goal is, walk through how the team is going to work through it. So that means you start from, you know, um, whatever model you're using, you're going to walk through those different phases and say, here's where I'm going to start you know, talking to everybody, I'm going to do a stakeholder analysis, and then we're going to do this. And then, you know, we're going to test it out, we're going to do our um, evaluative testing, whatever that is, walk through it. And here's what's even more important. As you're doing that, have them pipe in, have them tell you what you what they think is going to happen in that particular phase. And I'm not saying you want to spend a, a really long time, like forever doing this. But if you can do it in an hour or less, I'm telling you, it'll be well worth it because you're going to unearth some assumptions because we can have a project harder. 
we can go through lots of meetings where we talk about these things, but until you just do the little walk through of the project and have everybody pipe in, um, we're, we're going to lack clarity. Make sure everybody knows and shares purpose and they share expectations. The expectations that you have, the expectations that they have. How often are you meeting? Who should come to the meetings? You know, if people are expecting that they're gonna watch just the email that you send or post the meeting notes and that the meetings are optional, they need to express that up front and you need to know that up front. So you wanna make sure everybody's sharing all those expectations. Here's another fun one. Entice people in, bribe them. Bribe them and get them here with donuts and bagels and coffee. Why? Anybody have an idea on why you would wanna do that? Okay, so if they're sharing food, they're sharing an experience, and if they're coming to that meeting, they're going to be in that same room with each other. And remember what is high value. The highest value energy that we can share is that face-to-face -face interaction. That's what we're after. We're only settling for Zoom, and then we're only settling for phone calls when we have to, when it's just not practical to do things another way. So you really want that face-to-face -face interaction. Virtual donuts, I love that. I want a virtual donut. Okay, yeah, now I want something sweet. Um, I see a hand that's raised and I don't know if it's an old hand or a new hand. Siri, do you have a question or a comment to add? Okay, I'm gonna, well, you're on mute. I wonder if you're trying to speak and... No? Okay. So we'll move on. So check-ins. This one is, uh, in my opinion, most underutilized. And I think a lot of teams are using it now that they're in a virtual environment. But to me, check-ins should be a part of every meeting that is a, a, a standing weekly meeting. If you have multiple meetings in a week, you still might have check-ins. You might try to really shorten them up and tighten them up. But a check-in is where you offer everyone in the room an opportunity to share in one to two sentences where their head is, where their head is. You know, what are you thinking about right now? What's um, front of mind for you? What's or top of mind rather? Um, why is that important? Because this allows people to be human and it allows you to show that you're human as well. But this is how we can share some more experiences and be a, um, be vulnerable or transparent with each other and get a little emotion involved. Because here's the bottom line. People don't just do work. They're not just motivated to do work. People work for people and people work with people. And they're going to be more motivated when they're working with people that they feel connected to. So this check-in might sound a little loosey-goosey and soft, but I'm telling you, it's worth it. So if you just open a meeting with, okay, I'm just going to go around the room and just tell us in one to two sentences where your head is right now. And some people will go professional and some will go personal. And that's okay either way. There's no rule on this. So somebody might say, you know what, I've got this deadline at the end of this week. I've got to hit it. That's consuming me. That's all I'm thinking about. And that way, when everybody else in the room hears that, they know now is probably not a time to talk about, you know, something that they want to approach with them for two weeks from now. Another person might say, you know, I was just up all night last night with my daughter. She was throwing up. Um, fortunately, we found out she doesn't have COVID-19, but I'm exhausted. And you might go up to him and say, oh, you know, really sorry to hear that. And now might not be the time that you would advise him that he was late on a deliverable to you yesterday because you just heard his humanity and you just heard that he's like barely hanging on by a thread because he's sleep deprived and he's worried about his daughter. So just some thoughts there. Another thing you can do, I'm a huge fan, raise your hand or say in chat if you use Marco Polo with anybody in your personal life. Marco Polo, it's an app and it is a video chat app where you can just take a quick little video and send it like a Marco and then the person sends it back as a Polo. And it is super simple. If you haven't used Marco Polo with your friends and family, you're not living life to its fullest. I love it. Um, but you might use that or Skype recordings in your business context if there's a way to do a quick recording. Because remember, 
that's face to face too. It's the next best thing to being in person. So if you're going to go that route, try working on it first with individuals, communicate that way, and then suggest it to others and uh, say, okay, now, you know, can you send me a Marco about that? Because you're going to get way more context, a lot more expression in that than you would in a text or an email. Another thing you can do is use a RACI chart. And I know some of you put in an S in it, some of you don't. I just put in the RACI, responsible, accountable, consulted, and informed. So that really delineates roles and responsibilities very clearly. It's a more traditional model, a scary matrix. I like that one too. Um, and finally, make sure if you've got internationals or people where English is their second language, really think about how you can make things uh, available in print to them up front or in the meeting so that they can fully contribute. A lot of times people who have English as a second language can't pick up on everything quickly enough so that they can contribute, so that they can communicate. So if you make things available in print, and I say in print, digitally, you know, get them in words somehow to them in on the screen or in the meeting. Um, and then you might also consider having somebody available in chat for them so that if they have a question and they need clarification on something, somebody in chat is watching for them to say, what did they say? I didn't quite pick that up. You might prearrange something like that if you know that that is a potential barrier for one of your team members to get involved. So lots of different ways to help on the forming. Any other ideas that you guys have on how to help people communicate with each other during the forming stage? Uh, colorblind is a big thing. Yeah, making sure you don't use all sorts of different colors. Okay, not seeing anything yet. Oh, good. Talk about communication preferences. Love that one. Love that one, Chris. Um, and I can't remember, I think I've got it on another slide. Yes, email, text, phone. Okay, so let's talk about it since Chris brought it up. Communication preferences are huge. Um, and when you ask somebody for communication preferences, um, you know, ask him how they want to be uh, notified or how they want to be communicated to you and then how they like to communicate to others. Once you get that mapped out, share it with the whole team and make sure everybody knows how they can use it. Not just yourself, let everybody have it. Because if you are holding that as the project manager, um, you're missing out on the total benefit of such a resource because everybody needs to communicate directly with each other. And yes, MBTI is a great tool. I'm a fan of DISC. Um, and uh, there are tons of tools out there now, lots and lots of tools. So whatever tool speaks to you and helps you really think through um, the different people and the different things um, that they might be experiencing so that you can work alongside them, pull out all the stops, insights, great one. Yep. And then the recognition piece, that's a fabulous insight, making sure that you're recognizing people quickly up front um kind of setting the standard for how we operate as a team that we recognize and appreciate each other up front okay so we're going to move on into the storming so i got a picture of these dogs this reminds me of my dog how he likes to go up to other dogs and he just likes to be the alpha and so he'll walk up and he'll roar. now he just his bark is worse than his bite he doesn't bite but he's trying to assert himself and he's looking to see who's going to push back on him. And we all have those people in our teams as well. And your job as a, as a project manager is to referee all of those fights, right? Hopefully not. No, do not referee all the fights. Your job is to stand back and let them happen just to make sure that they're, you know, somewhat safe. For example, if people are being interrupted in a meeting, not okay. You got to cut that, uh, nip that in the bud. Um, if somebody's being attacked in the meeting, yeah, you got to nip that in the bud. But in terms of people, you know, kind of challenging each other's assumptions, challenging each other's opinions, perspectives, all of that, that just has to happen. Um, and that will, people will work through that naturally. 
So storming, what do you do when you have to test out the boundaries to build trust? Because that's what's happening. People are pushing and they're trying to figure out where the boundaries are for the team and for everybody else. So one thing you can do is use team voting. Love team voting. So let's say you're trying to make a decision. Everybody needs to vote. Instead of just saying, well, the majority wins, have a, a sliding scale of votes so that you can reveal or you can ask for people to reveal if they don't agree, but they're willing to support it outside of the team. So for example, you know, I, I want us to go out to lunch tomorrow and everybody votes and somebody says, I totally disagree. That's a total uh, loss of time. It's a misuse of our time. And, you know, but everybody else wants to do it. If everybody else votes to do it, that person has a, if we have a voting structure where it says, okay, I, I'm going to go along with it but I want you to know I don't agree, but I don't want to be the jerk that everybody hates because I won't just, you know, go. So then you want to have that sliding scale available. So it's not just yes, no, and then you're out. So think about those types of team votes. They're out there. Allow for organized dissension. And that's what I was saying. Just check the inter interruption, make sure that's not happening. And then work on upgrading low value communication styles. So your job is to go around and find out who's sending, you know, and that's not hard. Look at who's sending all the emails and then say, Hey, when was the last time you called? So-and-so instead of emailing, or, you know, I know I get a better reaction from Suzanne when I call her and talk to her instead of email her and see what they do. Another thing you can do is map out what you're seeing and make your game plan for each individual. So that means you're going to create a grid of all your people and you're going to say communicating a lot, communicating positively, communicating, but it's low value communication. And you're going to go through and plot out what you're seeing. And then you're going to employ things like MBTI and DISC and say, what do I know about this person and how can I help them work through this? And then how can I help them move toward the team purpose? Because everybody's either moving toward or away from the team purpose and the mission. The question is, which way are they going? Are they going away? Are they coming in? And if they're going away, your job is to kind of pull them back in somehow, some way. And you know what? You can get some Jedi points if you get somebody else to pull them in instead of you pulling them in, because that's a two for one. Now you've got people communicating with each other and you're getting them to come back towards the center purpose. What's their dominant buying motive? What is it they're really after? Some people are really after success. Some people are really after social standing. And some people are really after popularity. Others are after an easier time at work. They just, they just want to do, you know, just want to float through and not have any interruptions and not have any disturbances in their work. So you want to figure out what is their bottom line dominant buying motive. And then as Chris said, what is their preferred communication style? Now that's the only one that I would share with everybody because that one, you know, you can just say, Hey, I'm gathering everybody's, you know, collective preferences so that I can share with the team. You know, how do you like to receive communication? All these others are for you as, as the instigator of communication between team members. So I have, a, I have one slide, it's a summary slide um, that I will share with you. The norming, so what do you do during the norming phase? Well, you pr promote conversations between members and you do it again, between members, between members. Um, so you wanna make sure that if you see people doing that, that you call it out as a good thing. We said early on, recognition is good. So go and recognize them and just say, Hey, John, I noticed that you called Susan this time. Uh, um, you know, when, when you needed something, you called her up it, like nothing. And I really appreciate that. I mean, that's so helpful to me and just, you know, do whatever you have to do to promote it and to really recognize it as what you're looking for. Because the more you do that, the more people will go and continue to perpetuate these good behaviors. Begin each meeting with a very brief update on where the team is to goal. And that might sound simple. And some of you might be doing a lot. I'm sure a lot of you are doing that, but I mean, every meeting, where are we to our goal? Because that helps people kind of get 
grounded in the purpose and then the perspective on what's being done and how quickly you are uh, approaching your target. And then you also want to have something to celebrate at each meeting because that just kind of promotes the healthier culture as well. And then finally, continue to promote what you want more of in those team meetings. So make sure if people are really talking back and forth, say, man, this was a great meeting, even if it means they were sidebars and they were detracting from what you were doing. It's so counterintuitive. Um, in my opinion, and it seems illogical to think that half of those good communications are individual in nature and not to the team, but that is an indication of a high performing team because people are talking to each other. So when you think about the team needing to know the goal and then achieving overachieving with autonomy, what do you need to do? Just keep celebrating because if you're not pressing forward, you're always sliding backwards. So never become complacent, never be okay with where you are, just press forward continuously. And then watch who's exploring and study the mix of discovery versus integration. So you're watching to see who those people are who are going outside of the team to get different perspectives and bring them back in because you want more of that and you wanna see what they're getting into um, and then you can start working on talking to others about, you know, I noticed, you know, Dan went over there and asked them how they handled this problem. I wonder what other teams have encountered this problem. And you might be planting the seeds and the ideas for others to go and explore other areas as well. So this is the, the full slide. And this is a slide that I have packaged for you to send your way. I'll put it in chat in a couple of minutes if that works well for you. Um, so let me ask you, what questions do you have? Anything that comes to mind or bonuses that you wanna share with the team? Any? Somebody said go back. Go back to here. Robert, is that what you were looking for? I have something to um, say about the storming. Oh, the summary, he got it, okay. I have a question about the summer of uh, storming and I don't know if you mentioned it or not, or I just fell asleep. No, I didn't. Sure. <laughs> no, um, I love this model because it is, simple enough to understand um and the thing that i've noticed with storming before you get to storming is to have a strategy for like when we have conflict mm -hmm. which you will have in storming guaranteed here's what we're going to do about it before it actually happens so if there is an escalation process or you know um there's rules of engagement or or, or team rules or, or meeting rules or something is to have that in place before it happens because you know it will that's a great point dale so set uh, expectations up front and when i say uh, limits set limits and boundaries before they're tested to the max mm -hmm. you know because that's a that's a really good point Pro proactively putting the guardrails on before people drive the car off the cliff. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic idea. So yes, um, some protocols and meeting structure, those expectations. So yeah, that's a, that's a really good tactic to add under those expectations that you're setting and forming. Now I have a question in the chat. Somebody said, what's the best way to integrate a new team member? Um, are we thinking that this new team member is joining in the middle of a project or at the beginning with everybody else? And you can talk to us, you don't have to chat. And then uh, anybody have ideas on the best way to integrate a new team member? What, a, what have been your, um, your best practices in that regard that you've seen very helpful? Well, I, the, here's the thing I always assume when we have a new team member, we should go back to the forming stage. You still got to st start as if it's an, a new version of the team and not assume if you're norming and performing that you're going to continue to norm and perform when you've got a new person joining. 
you got to go back and kind of get through the forming, storming, norming, performing again. I'm going to agree with that. And I tell you what, for, um, I'm going to go back to what Chris said about sharing communication preferences. Mm -hmm. That's a great thing as a team activity when you come together at the beginning of a project, or if a new team member is introduced, like you said, Dale, go back to that very first phase, get real clear and just go through that forming phase, go through the rigor of it, but you know, pretty quickly for the sake of that new team member, but have everybody there because everybody needs to be part of it. If they're not there, it signals to that person that it's, it's not very important, but it also gives them an experience to share. Something else you can do if you get everybody to share their communication preferences, you can also say, tell us, you know, kind of about your personality or how you operate and everybody goes around the room and does it. That will not only educate that new team member, it also helps everybody remember each other because I guarantee you they're not thinking about each other all the time. Um, but if you take that, you know, 20 minutes that it takes to do that, it is well worth the time to do that. And it, it really says we're going to catch up this person and we're going to slow down just enough for this person to jump on this moving train and not get run over by it. And that signals a lot of goodwill from the team to that new member that really helps. Mm -hmm. um, we have another question here. It says, in a meeting, how do you work with someone who likes to talk and ends up taking more time than seems reasonable? Oh, so I'm going to ask first, I, I'm always interested in how other people are handling it first, and then I'll tell you what I think. Other people, what do you think? I see, I saw somebody moving like they were going to say something. So, okay, ground rules. Yeah. So mm -hmm. the ground rules, I think another thing you can say is, um, you talk to them outside of the meeting and say, you know, I, I notice you offer a lot of uh, help in the meeting. One of the things you want to look for is what is it that they're talking about a lot and why is it that they feel the need to say all of that? Um, but you might also say, look, I really need help. We're, our team, here's my goal is for our team to talk to each other. Uh, that's what we're after because I know that that's what's going to help our team work more effectively is if they talk to each other. And so I'm looking for your ideas on how we can do that in meetings. Can you help me watch for who's not talking and help me figure out ways to get them involved? That way I'm not even talking about the fact that they're talking all the time. I'm giving them a task to do that gets them thinking with other people in mind instead of what it is that they're thinking about that entire time because they probably need something else to think about anyway, but they really need to be engaged with those other team members. Mm -hmm. All right. JJ so, says for a talker, try asking them to select one or two key points to make each meeting. There you go. That, I love that. So anything you can do to kind of not, talk about the elephant in the room, but just kind of get the elephant out of the room, like move them completely. That's, that's my objective is that's root cause problem solving. Hopefully, um, use the foosball method, ping them in the head. And what is that? And talk to holding the foosball. I like that. Oh okay. yeah, yeah. I was going to throw a foosball stick. at him, yeah, yeah. but that's probably not appropriate. Mm -hmm. I like that idea. So whoever's got the talking stick, talking ball, they, they can right. do it. Yeah. So some really good things there. Any other questions that you guys would like to tackle? I don't want to be, yeah, we're about there. Thoughts regarding periodic team building exercises or team outings throughout the project, maybe primarily at milestones or maybe randomly. Okay. So one of the things they said in this study with the sociometrics was that social time is really important. And here's what I would say about that social time. The more you blend it, the better off you are. And that means, that's why I said those check-ins. And then if people start going off on a tangent near the end of a meeting, let it happen. Or in the middle of a meeting, allocate a little time for that. Because if they can have that social time talking about non-work stuff, that is going to be great. What they said in the, the study is they noticed that was happening. And so they tried to have a beer summit. And they said it didn't have a very good effect. But when they put long lunch tables in place, 
then all of a sudden people were socializing more because people who didn't really know each other were ending up sitting next to each other. So if you try to do it, I don't want to say formally, informally, but like, let's say you have like a bowling activity and everybody's invited. That's when it's kind of forced and it's kind of tough to get there. So just see if you can create little pockets of socialization. And you might even just say, you know, the first half of today's call is going to be about the stuff that we're doing. The second half is just what you're doing this weekend. Um, and it, you know, might kind of position it. I used to have um, social calls uh, for the team end of Friday, like two o'clock because I knew they weren't thinking about work anyway. And that was a great time because they were geographically dispersed. And this was 2008, um, before we had Zoom. We had WebEx, but we didn't have it because it was too expensive for us. Um, we were, that was during the recession and Whirlpool was pinching every penny. So we would just jump online and talk to each other on conference calls and same time chat and do chat message at the same time. And it was a lot of fun. Um, Google it. Lean coffee. I don't know what lean coffee is. I don't have fat coffee, but lean coffee. What is lean coffee? So, that, so there's a link here that 3JJ provided for oh. um, lean coffee, which just looks like okay. some kind of very lean coffee. Okay. I'm digging that. Okay. So before I forget, I owe you two things. So I'm going to share with you the, that money slide, uh, um, let me change it. I'm going to send it just, I think somebody besides Belinda wanted it. So let me give it to everybody. Um, so you've got those last few slides and while, and I'll come back to questions that are popping up, but I just want to kind of recap here and just say, look, when you think about a team, remember the team is made up of individuals. So if you want your team to be high performing, your goal is to spark high value communication between all of the members of the team, all of them. And if you do that, then your team's performance will be stellar. And now go be Garth. Cause that was the number one thing. Everybody wanted to be a rock star. So now right, you can go be right. Garth. Um, just a little bit about me. I'm going to share with you my contact information. Oops. I will get there. I will share with you my contact information um, so that you can reach out to me in whatever way you like. If you want to talk about specifics of this stuff, I love to talk about these things. So feel free to reach out to me any way that you can think about it or any way that you're interested in con continuing to connect. Um, and I'm offering a promo. If you want to check out a, a series of onboarding virtual courses in a pandemic, I've developed them and I've given you a link in chat that will get you there for $12 off the course bundle. But there are also some free things out there if you just want to check those out. Feel free. I'd love for you just to, to go and check it out, see what other thoughts um, you might pick up along the way. But like I said, I'm happy to talk uh, in another Zoom session, just a, a handful of people if you guys want to talk about some of the details of this. All right. Well, thank you for that. So any other questions? Did I miss any questions, Dale? I don't see that you missed any questions. Okay. Um, I think we've gone through it. Other questions that you have for Aaron relating team building, concerns, obstacles that you running across? Okay. Well, it was fun to be with you guys, but I'll be here until the meeting closes out if you have any random questions that pop up. Just a quick question. Well, I think it, it came up earlier on. Somebody mentioned there's a Drexler Civit model that's different than or maybe similar or different than um, the Tuckman model. Um, Drexler. Yeah, the Drexler Civit model uh, goes through team creation and team maintenance, uh, goes through seven stages of set understanding the goal of why you're here, uh, who you're with, uh, what it is that you're trying to work on, how you're going to do the work. Then you get into the uh, actual performing the work, hopefully get into the wow stage, and then it's the closing out phase. Hmm. That's okay. similar. And, and who, and that's a different, who was this that was saying that? 
uh, David Quinn with Mosaic Technologies Group. Oh, okay. Okay, great. Do you have a link you could provide in the chat to um, if somebody is interest, interested in that model? Because, I mean, there are a lot of different team building models. PMI does love Tuckman models. Okay, so right. if you go, if you take the PMP test, probably the Tuckman model will be on there. But um, there's the one thing about any model is you choose one ahead of time and this is you say and here's the model that we're going to provide or this is the one we're going to follow so everybody's on board about what which model that you're utilizing so great any other questions or other ideas that you want to offer all right so i'm going to just change the screen here erin yeah let me go ahead and stop sharing all right and I'll share my screen here. Okay, so you should be seeing the, um, this session here is worth one and a half leadership PDUs. And here is your claim code. You go into PMI.org and you could use this claim code in order to get your one and a half PDUs. If you put your name and your first name and your last name and your email address in the chat. Okay, we'll capture the chat information so we make sure that um, you get your uh, one and a half PDUs if you don't do it yourself. We like to try to upload it. This is kind of a new process we're doing. So um, we'll see if this works out. So um, we'll try to upload the um, if you attended this session up to the PMI.org website, but also make sure that you go in there and you get your credit as well. So don't just rely on us. Um, next month um, is our next, our third meeting, the third session, uh, third Thursday of the month. Again, we're gonna be utilizing virtual uh, platform. It'll be on uh, June, 18th, and I'll be from, again, from our 6, 6.30 to 8 o'clock, okay? Um, the information about the meeting will be on the website as well as in your newsletter. If you're new to us, ATPMI, make sure you sign up for the newsletter. Go to the ATPMI.org website so that you make sure that you get the emails and the information. Also make sure if you're on any social media sites, whether it's on Facebook, uh, Twitter, um, or, um, or any other, um, on the website as well, you just keep checking back for all the events that we're trying to push out there as best we can. Okay, any other questions or concerns that you have for this evening? In our two minutes that we have left? Nobody minds an early ending, right, Dale? <laughs> yeah, we have uh, two minutes left. I can give back to everybody. Well, thank you, everybody, um, for participating. Make sure that you check us out for next month as well as uh, if you have any people that want to become sponsors, if your organization wants to become a sponsor of our PDD coming up, or you know people that want to be able to be a breakout speaker, just let us know at um, etpmi.org website. Thanks and have a great rest of your evening.